All right, and let's go with a little bit of an intro. Have you ever wondered why you struggle to find success or fulfillment or lasting happiness? It's probably because your default wiring is set to lose. The How to Win at Everything podcast looks at real people who have struggled with the same insecurities, fears, doubts, and expectations and found a way to succeed. Why? Their brains are rewired for success. We dive into their thought patterns to show you how to rewire your own brain to win at everything. All right. That is my intro, Janet. Just want you to know I did that all by myself. Thank you. And uh, I loved it. It was great. <laughs> Me all energized. Right. See, that's what I was, at least that's what I was hoping for. So uh, it is good to have you here. Uh, crowd, just in case you have not met Jennifer Beats, she's Jennifer, and you can see how she spells her name phonetically for us just because uh, somewhere, somehow, people were getting this wrong. So I just right. want to call that out first. So, Jen, thank you so much for being with us this evening. We talked probably, what, a couple of weeks ago after one of those humans' first meetings. And look, guys, I'm going to tell you now, I, I, I sometimes dote on my guests just a little bit because I really want to make sure that I'm bringing people in who I'm personally amazed by. And Jennifer is definitely one of those people. Um, we had a conversation about uh, just the normal stuff that we like to talk about, things like um, when it comes to uh, uh, being introspective, when we talk about things that are limiting beliefs and things that are fearful, uh, that's my wheelhouse. And and Jan is like the epitome of a person who's like seeing herself and seeing other people and that allows her to give a hand with that sort of thing. So let me put you on the spot, Jen. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, first of all, nice to see you again, Kelly. Yes, yes, I thank really you. I really enjoyed our conversation last time. And yep. I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity today. Thank you. Being no, to thank be you. Yeah. On your show and to talk about something I am so passionate about yep. and that is about empowering others and mm -hmm. especially women mm -hmm. to shatter their limiting beliefs so I know that I had my fair share of limiting beliefs that uh, kept me repeating the same patterns mm -hmm. and um, kept success well at bay and uh, it wasn't until I slowed down and started paying attention that mm -hmm. I was able to release those old beliefs. So, so let me just go ahead and make sure we get a chance to know a little bit about you. W what are you doing right now? So, what, what what's your uh, what's your what's your career in right now? What are you doing? Currently, I am breaking into the coaching space, and mm -hmm. I left my corporate job in November of 2019 as I mm -hmm. felt more of a pull to be working closely on my purpose. I was looking for mm -hmm. more meaning in my life and in my relationships and in my job, mm -hmm. and I found that by coaching others, that really allows me to, well, it's a win-win situation. It empowers right. me when I'm working with others who are struggling with their emotions or with some old limiting beliefs that they had. And also it's a win-win when I get together with women and we share similar experiences and similar okay. stories and we can collectively rise above the noise so that we reach our full potential. So that's a really good place to start. Let me ask you, what, what, so actually let me back you up just a little bit. What, what, what was your background? before you got into sure. culture. Oh, well, thank you for asking, Kelly. I have, um, well, I did a bit of moving around in my adult life. And so uh -huh. I'm what many call a late bloomer. Gotcha. I didn't go to university right out of high school. 
-hmm. In fact, it wasn't until I became, well, in my early 30s that Mm -hmm. I decided to push myself out of my comfort zone and enter into university at a time when my peers were considerably younger than me. (laughs) And I really had to... Right. I really had to face some fears in order to put myself in that situation. And I'm so glad that I did, as I found that that was an environment where I really blossomed. I really opened up and I started to get more analytical in my thinking. Mm. I started to get more curious and ask more questions. However, I when I graduated from university as a as many students graduate, we Mm -hmm. aren't full of confidence to step out there and try new things. And that's exactly what happened to me, Kelly. Here I was a fresh university student, although a little later in life, (laughs) and I wanted to re-enter the workforce in a new Mm -hmm. area. I had just been educated in conflict resolution. Hmm. However, the industry, the field wasn't really rich with opportunities. And yet, I know that I have a really good, my skill set is really good working with Mm -hmm. people. I love developing relationships with people and Mm -hmm. find that extremely easy. And so I put myself back into work positions where I was at the front line and I was working with people. And yet, I would keep putting myself in those positions and then reaching the top of those positions in a short amount of time. Hmm. And so with that restless energy, I would leave and find something else that had more responsibility. And well, eventually after a few years of doing that, I woke up to find that I was lacking meaning and purpose in my job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At that same time, I recognized that my relationships were also suffering. Okay. And that if I was being honest, my relationship was not in a place where I was happy. Okay. So are we talking relationship with kids, with family, with the spouse? What, my personal specific? relationship, my personal marriage. At gotcha. the time, I was in a marriage of 19 years. And I felt that my relationship was also lacking that love mm. and that meaning that I was on a journey to find. Mm-hmm. So, and, so, well, let me ask you then. Well, well, mm-hmm. first, let me start with the decision to go back or to go to school uh, after after you had been out for a while. Um, a lot of us are faced with that, uh, especially when we hit our 30s and 40s where uh, either we're undereducated or we're ill-equipped for whatever we'd like to go into. What, mm. what do you think, what was the push that said, try that, go into kind of an unknown space? Certainly, I was in a position in my life where I had two children, mm-hmm. and I did voluntarily choose to leave the workforce to raise my two children with the understanding that I would go back someday. And I knew that if I didn't add to my skill set, that I would stay where I was. Hmm. Also, I had this, well, I just had this pull inside of me. I kind of had the fear of missing out. Um, Many of my peers, many of my family had gone to university. And I made different decisions. And yet that was still something that I wanted to achieve in my life. And so when I voluntarily left the workforce and was raising my children, it started to bubble up again. And that's when I decided to take one course, just one evening course, see if I liked it, see if it was something I still wanted to do. Mm. I'm so glad I took that first step because it was definitely something I wanted to do. Let me ask you this. Were you, so I know that there was a portion of you that was uh, itching to kind of go back into school and that sort of thing. Uh, were you, And I know you were also saying that you felt unfulfilled or at the very least, like you weren't meeting up to your full potential. Uh, did it, do you feel like it caused you a measure of resentment for your current life, the life you were living in? Or was it just like, hey, uh, I'm fine here, but I want more? 
Oh, no, Kelly, I think you hit it uh, the nail on the head. You know, um, definitely while I was out meeting other people's needs mm -hmm. at the expense of my own happiness, sure. that that's what was costing me in my job and in my relationships and in my overall life. Uh, I have learned that when I put my needs to the bottom, that that is when that resentment starts to grow for me. And gotcha. I wasn't aware of that, actually. Um, it wasn't until I got really quiet and started the practice of meditation that mm. I became aware of some, some patterns that I was repeating in my life. Are you able to kind of speak to those? Because uh, what I'm hoping to do, um, because I know you're you're one of those one of those kind of rare people who has kind of talked about this a lot, at least with yourself and that sort of thing. Uh, can you share some of that with the audience about what exactly you were seeing, like what those patterns were, and how you became like, you know, how did they become visible to you? How did you recognize them? Mm -hmm. I know that um, that I kept coming up to that feeling of being lost, of not knowing what I want. Mm -hmm. I kept feeling like there was more, and yet I didn't know where to find more. I didn't mm -hmm. know where to look. And to be quite honest, if I had one more person tell me that I should be happy in my life, I was going mm -hmm. to explode. <laughs> I really was because yeah. I thought I was a happy person and being happy wasn't getting me what I wanted. And mm. so it wasn't aligning. And to be quite honest, I didn't believe that that I just needed to be happy. And so it was it was that I mean, just being what is all that about? Why do people constantly talk about being grateful? and how that can add to your life. Because, well, frankly, at that stage of my life, I didn't see it. And as I would talk to my friends and, and, and you know, they would come back and say, well, you know, ask me those deeper questions. I didn't have the answers. Mm. And that was frustrating me, right? Here yeah. I said, I, you know, I'm happy. I do tend to wear a smile on my face quite a bit. Sure. And yet, maybe that's just another way of coping, Okay. right? Yeah. Is to keep yeah. myself busy and be distracted I, and put I, that I, smile I on. I know it face. well, yeah. So, okay. So when when you have uh, the other friends in your life, the, the other people in your world, they're coming back and they're telling you, hey, based on what we're seeing from the outside, you should be happy. And you realize that you're not. So. Right. First thing you do is you you go back to school. Uh, what what was next for you in that uh, kind of that journey? Well, as I said, after I I ended up being out of the workforce for ten years oh, right, to raise right. my my children, and as I went back into the workforce, well, I played small. I found myself putting myself back in my comfort zone. Okay. I didn't want to try new things. I had already went to school. I thought I tried new things. That's right. You, right? you already won, right? <laughs> right. And so now here I am with my education and these new things aren't happening. And mm -hmm. I was still very much operating from a victim mentality. And, and oh, isn't this interesting, Kelly? I felt yeah. like a victim and I was finding myself in situations sure. where I was the victim. Okay, so, so now I got to ask you about this because this is obviously pretty common. Um, but but I want to get your idea for uh, your idea of it and, and how you're seeing it. So so where do you think that comes from? Why why did you kind of relegate yourself to that role? Oh, the, the where do I think that the that stems um, from? Uh, certainly my limiting beliefs, the sure. messages that I received when I was young and a lot of the conditioning that I received led gotcha. me to believe that opportunities, well, I, I suppose I had this belief that happiness was something to be chased, 
And it yeah. actually seemed quite elusive. I could never yeah. be happy. <laughs> right. It didn't matter how much more I achieved or how many more accomplishments I had. Um, I just right. still felt this lack in my life. Like, why weren't things working out for me? What was I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. And that, that type of curiosity, those types of questions, I, I really wanted to start finding the answers to. Sure. And that's when I started to dig a little bit deeper. So it it's interesting kind of hearing about the journey. Um, I know that one of your big things and, and one of the things that is writing your uh, is right in, in your LinkedIn profile and we met on LinkedIn. So uh, the idea of helping women, especially with those self-limiting beliefs, you, you talked a little bit earlier about there being sort of a common ground, sort of a um, a, a place where where you and other women are able to relate. What, what, what kind of situations are those? How, how, how are you doing that? And uh, how is that working out with the different women that you work with? Mm -hmm. Well, a common thing I hear with a lot of women is that I'm not enough. Hmm. A lot, I hear a lot of women say, I don't want to be alone. Sure. I hear a lot of women say, I'm not ready yet. I, I just, I want it to be perfect. Mm. And R ready, ready, for, ready in what way? What are what are they looking at? I'm not ready to take that next step. I'm not ready for that next level of success. I have to do more. Oh, I have to gotcha. find out more. I, I couldn't possibly be ready. Right. Sure. And oftentimes it's just in our own language that we're using that we're limiting, limiting. our potential. Yeah. And so I really hear this with women as we attach it to our self-worth mm -hmm. and we're putting ourselves in situations. Um, I mean, I've even heard of how women put ourselves in situations where we show up to an interview and we have the same qualifications as our peers. And yet when a male is asked in that same interview for the amount of income they want compared sure, to a woman, sure a woman will at many times ask for less because she doesn't feel ready. She sure. doesn't feel like she has, well, maybe I have five of the qualifications out of all 10 hmm. and therefore I'm not ready. Whereas I have seen gotcha. men walk into situations where they have one skill, three skills. They don't have all 10 skills and yet, they walk into those interviews with confidence. Now, and so, the, mm -hmm. well, so now I'm going to ask you to project a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you don't, you know, it's not a one size fits all sort of situation. Uh, but where do you think that stems from? Because it does seem to be something systematic having to do with yes. women. Why do you think so many women end up in that same sort of category uh, of beliefs? Again, it really takes me back to my childhood okay the messages that i received as a young girl which in my generation some of those messages were that children were to be seen and not heard sure, sure. some of those messages were don't rock the boat don't start anything don't mm. question authority don't ask don't ask mm -hmm. for help sweep conflict under the rug Mm. Being a good girl. What mm -hmm. does a good girl mean? <laughs> and sure, so yeah. I know in my own story, I lost my voice very early mm -hmm. in my family. Mm -hmm. And I never, I just, I took that right into adulthood. Sure. And I took that right into uh, repetitive behaviors from when I was a young child that I never processed. And so as I went into adulthood, I brought those same beliefs with me. And what okay. served me at one time was no longer, what served me as a young child was no mm. longer me as an adult. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you think that this affected, well, I'm sure it affected it. Um, 
your your relationship. I know you say you're not married. You're no longer married. Uh, it was a 19 year marriage. Uh, how do you think that affected your your marriage and your relationship, or or at least how it started? Did did you seek out somebody who wasn't fulfilling uh, those sort of mm. for you because of the fact that maybe uh, of the way you grew up, or, or do, you, do you know what I mean? Like, did, do you mm-hmm. think that that you attracted that kind of person? Or that kind of relationship? Absolutely. absolutely. When I reflect on my story, I have a early incident. I was in my late teens when I stepped into an abusive relationship. Mm-hmm. And I allowed that to go on longer than it needed to, longer sure. than it served me well. And when I got out of that relationship, I survived that relationship. I took those survival skills with me and I was really looking for a safe place where I could be myself. And when I met my then husband, he was that safe place. And over the years of our marriage, um, I had at the time a lot of people pleasing tendencies and those people pleasing tendencies allowed me to live a life where I was so concerned about making sure that everybody else was happy that I forgot about what I needed yeah. to be happy. Right? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it gives me goosebumps that's... when I talk about it too. Yeah. I, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's unique in the sense that it's your personal story, but then understanding like I'm certain so many people relate to this also so so let me ask you this um when at what point do you think or what point do you feel like things shifted what what was the turning point where you said no more no more of uh, of following these same patterns no more of being a victim no more of this i'm gonna be the person who changes and helps other people what what happened for you there I, I, I slowed down to hear my voice. Hmm. And when I heard my inner critic hmm. and the way that I was speaking to myself, that's when I recognized this has to change. This cannot go on like this anymore. Did you did you have uh, outside resources, family, therapy? What, what 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 involved what was involved in you being able to stop and slow down to hear that because i don't know that everybody has just like a a willingness to mm-hmm. to stop and listen to themselves or, or you know most of us are sweeping that under the rug so so what what resources did you have to help you with that a lot of mentors gotcha gotcha so i went into do it yourself mode okay. um in my story as i mentioned i was in my career and not fulfilled. I had just stepped out of a 19 year marriage Mm. and have two children. Mm -hmm. They were my number one priority. Sure. Sure. Where I was working, I knew that I was already at the top and I know I still have some years to retirement. Yeah. And so I did what I often do. And that is how do I rebuild? I've put myself in this situation several times in my life. I know how to get out of a mess. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do what I know how to do. And my number one Clifton strengths finder is input. And for me, that means reading and researching. And so I looked to the greats. I started to look into biographies of others who were successful. I started to practice meditation and I started to lean on meditation teachers, Tara Brock, Dr. Rick Hansen, Sharon Salzberg. I started Deepak Chopra. I started to fill my mind with soul searching evidence um, about what it takes to be successful and how the way that we think is really 80% of our success. Now, let me ask you about that, because this is uh, another one of those places where I believe it gets choppy at best, because 
when when most people I I've known who are at that at that sort of impasse where it it's it, it's not you you can't you can't make your way through anymore. You have to break through a wall. A lot of people turn back from that. So I imagine there had to be a measure of fear, a measure of like doubt and that sort of thing in your mind. What do you think give gave you the strength at that point to keep moving into that direction? Because I'm certain as you're figuring out stuff, you're you're probably coming to grips with some of the some of the uh, patterns that you've seen in yourself and saying, "Oh crap, was that me? Ooh, mm-hmm. oh!" And so, what do you think gives you the strength or courage or whatever it took to kind of get past that and to keep going? It's something I never did before. I started asking people around me for feedback. Hmm. I started deliberately asking people that I trusted Mm -hmm. what my best traits were, what what wasn't I good at. Mm -hmm. And as that information started to trickle in, I started to recognize that I had to take some responsibility for my actions. It's a big word there. Right. And that I recognized that I was expecting others to bring me happiness. And once I recognized that I was responsible for my own happiness Mm -hmm. and that I could control my happiness, that's when things started to get a little looser. And I started to take my hands off (laughs) the grip. I have a tendency to grip and hang on for dear life. And letting go has got to be one of the hardest things for me to ever fully do. And yet the most freeing, it has brought me the most freedom in my life to learn how to let go and the practice of meditation has really got me out of my head Hmm. and and taught me how to let go of needing that certainty to let go of needing to know the outcome so it's odd that you say this because uh, you, you're describing two things that for a lot of people is going to feel like an oxymoron. You're saying that your ability to let go is what gave you control. And mm-hmm. and it, it doesn't seem like it should work that way, right? It's like the more you hold on really tight, the more you're going to have control. And uh, it, it's interesting that just before that, you mentioned that you taking responsibility once you once you have these people giving you this information you being able to take responsibility is now giving you this ability to take control which is allowing you to let go and i think that is such a key point um can you do you have any examples or anything that you can think of that uh was a situation where you did that where you put that into action Well, first of all, I just also mentioned that I have a history, a hard time letting go. Yeah. And so one of the mentors that I uh, found a lot of value from is a coach you may have heard of, you may be familiar with. Her name is Mel Robbins. And Mel Robbins has a book, uh, The Five Second Rule. Mm Mm-hmm. And I was following her for some time and getting quite involved in her work. And she brought out a training program called a 30-day mindset reset. Mm. And at this point and juncture in my life, I was ready to try something new. Gotcha. And I sat down for those 30 days and I tuned into her. And the reason that I feel I'm able to show up for those 30 days is, again, it takes me back to my meditation practice. Simply sitting every day has given me valuable tools in my toolbox, such Mm -hmm. as consistency, Mm -hmm. discipline. And so I showed up for those 30 days. I did that mindset reset with her. Mm -hmm. And I just started to set my morning up for success and every day I showed up 
and set my morning up for success, mm -hmm. I became more successful. So it sounds like it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy in either either side of this. When you when you're looking for the bad, you're, it, you're gravitating toward those kind of relationships, those sort of situations. When you're looking for the success, it sounds like you're gravitating toward those. Um, let me ask you this then. So, and I'm gonna take a little bit of a left turn here, but let's mm -hmm. say at the end of all of this, right? Last day of Jennifer Beats being here on this earth, here on your deathbed, how do you know, how do you define if you won? How do you define if if you if you're happy with it, if you're proud? If I'm listening to my own voice. Okay. That how do you mean? How do you mean? mean if I'm not allowing the opinions and ideas and thoughts of others drive my happiness? Okay. And so when I am tuned into my own voice, mm -hmm. That's when I'm honoring myself. That's when I'm speaking my truth. That is when I am my authentic self and in my highest potential. Gotcha. What 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 do you think you will have accomplished by being this person for the rest of your life? Mm, I think that the more we know about ourselves, the more that we grow ourselves professionally and personally, the better we can show up for others, mm -hmm. the more present we can be for others. You know, I spoke about how I used to have my hands closed. And when your hands are closed and you're hanging on to everything, I can't receive. Yeah. I, I need to let go in order to receive. And I was not receiving. I was giving and not receiving. Now I'm in better harmony. Hmm. Now I give and receive and trust myself. Hmm. Trust myself to know better. I trust myself to make good decisions. Oh, I okay. know now. Yeah, see, now I was going to ask about that one because uh, the idea of trusting yourself, I'm sure, can be scary if nothing else. But what what about now? What about what happens now when uh, you find that you've taken a false step, or it's something that maybe you regret that, or it's something that you would have done differently now? How how are you dealing with that? Well, I'd be lying if I said that I don't have struggles and mm -hmm. that every day is perfect mm -hmm. and that the doubt doesn't pop up and mm -hmm. that the naysayers don't pop up yeah, and that that imposter syndrome doesn't bubble up from time right. to time, yeah. right? The truth is all of that still exists. Mm -hmm. Only I've got myself to a position where I'm not reacting to all of that anymore. Gotcha. I'm actually choosing to be present in the moment and to yeah. take in that information, to reflect on that information and to respond. You mm -hmm. know, my life, I used to, I used to be a lot busier. Sure. I used to make sure that I was always doing something. Yeah. And now I tend to live from a place where doing, I look for pockets of time where I'm, I'm able to let my mind wander and not be so busy because it's being busy with all those distractions that mm -hmm. takes me away from my voice, I'm listening, the noise, the external noise gets louder and louder sure. as I pay attention to what others are doing, or at the very worst, compare myself to others. When I start doing those types of things, that's where I catch myself. My favorite quote is about comparison is that, you know, mm. comparison is the thief of joy. And it really is. I, yeah. I didn't realize that uh, until I woke up to 
the amazing possibilities in my life. And now I don't look out my window wondering, well, why does this person have that? And why is this happening for them and not me? Or why me? Or why? Yeah. I don't wonder that anymore now. Now I look out my window and I'm like, who can I serve? <laughs> who, who needs, you know, a smile? Who needs to be inspired? Who needs to be empowered? Now, right. let me ask you about that then, right? Because uh, when you when you say that, I, I hear two different things. I, I remember you mentioning before that you've been serving other people. You've been you've been serving other people, but it felt very negative and reductive. So what's the difference now in you serving other people where it seems to be bringing you joy and fulfillment and purpose? So what, what's the difference in those? The difference is I'm serving from a place of peace. I'm ah. serving from a place of love. I was serving from a place of lack and a place where I felt like a victim of my circumstances, a victim of what the universe had in mind. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I shifted my mindset and stepped into the gratitude that I have for where I am and sure. what I have, regardless of the outcome, that I started to feel joy and I started okay. to feel happy and I started to let go of that negativity. Now, this is a, this is an interesting thing then because initially, so, so you're doing the same act, you're, you're serving other people, but the difference in, in how, and how and what you receive seems to be based on your own state of mind, your own heart, your own where you're coming from is it so does that mean that when you were serving people initially you were like trying to fill up some bottomless pit of of of, of like getting something from other people and if so what 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 was that what what do you think you're trying to fulfill at that point uh yes i i was yes me with my hand up <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I was trying to be liked in the worst way. Gotcha. gotcha. Very common for women, too, is I was trying to fit in. I was mm -hmm. trying to be well-liked. And mm -hmm. I had it in my mind that I had to be the one who sacrificed to make others happy. Yeah. I just, I had some lessons early on in life. I mentioned earlier that my, I lost my voice early on in life. Yeah. And, and through that just picked up some negative self beliefs along the way. And I never questioned them. Yeah. I honestly believed everything I thought. Yeah. Legit, Kelly. It wasn't until meditation came into my life and taught me that right we have up to 60,000 thoughts a day and that mm. we do not need to hang on to every single thought matter of sure. fact most of them aren't even true yeah they're just thoughts uh, isn't it isn't it interesting that the the power of a self-limiting belief is almost completely in the fact that it's hidden you know, we're 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 not getting something from someone else telling us that we're not good enough. Uh, what I find is typically most of us are esteemed by other people, and um, we'll find in our own minds that we're still like, yeah, well, they have to say that. You know, that's my wife; she has to tell me that I'm good enough. You know, this is this is my job; they can't tell me that I'm a, a horrible worker. That sort of thing. Uh, isn't it really interesting, like how powerful it becomes because we're hiding it from ourselves? Yes. Um, so that I want to, I want to try to get a real good grasp of your, your, the dynamic of you going through this. So uh, uh, you're, you're so introspective that it's always fun to talk to you about this stuff because you're, you're able to kind of put your finger right on the pulse of what happens in the moment and that sort of thing. Uh, so when it comes to uh, the, when it comes to the self-limiting belief, when it comes to the things that you haven't questioned and that sort of thing, what, what, what exactly do you think is, is the key? I, I don't know if everyone's going to go 
into meditation and that sort of thing, but before they get to a point where they choose what to do, how did I identify what's what's a self-limiting belief? Mm-hmm. It really is what are you struggling with, right? What keeps popping up in your life? Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, I know I kept repeating the message that I'm not enough. Sure. I'm not enough. And every time I would step into a situation, I would bring that old belief with me. Yeah. And so one of the things is to really sit down and, and honestly take an introspective look at your life mm-hmm. and ask yourself, right, where am I happy? And if so, in what areas? Mm-hmm. If not, where am I struggling? What keeps coming up for me? And I just know that as you write down a few things, you're going to see a few patterns emerge, right? Mm. And a lot of that's going to tie back into those old messages, those old beliefs that you've been carrying around with you, right? Maybe it was something a parent said to you. Mm. I know for me, my mom told me that I was too sensitive. Mm. I am a highly sensitive person as a matter of fact i didn't know what was going on at that young age when she told me that sure but what i do know is that i attached a negative (laughs) connotation to it yeah and that whenever someone said i was sensitive i wanted to do a 180 i wanted to prove to them no i'm not flawed i'm not sensitive i can Mm -hmm. be what you need me to be Right, yeah. taking on that chameleon type mm. um, attitude, right? Like, just like me, you you like me, right? Mm. Just that, mm, that feeling, like I just want to fit in and belong. And you know, I recognize Kelly through my own inner work that that feeling I really wanted was something that I could give myself. And that I was really looking for all of that from other people when in actuality, I really needed to give that to myself. Mm. That's such a beautiful thing. So along the lines of, of, of that journey, there are going to be, I hope at least some, some other people watching this. Uh, Some of them are going to be women who have come up under the same uh, self-limiting ideals that you have. And when when they see this, what do you tell them should be their their immediate step? So maybe they don't have the exact same ideas as you, but w- what do you tell them is your is their first most immediate thing to do? Mm. I feel that they really need to figure out what it is they want. Okay. You know, so many times in life, we're very good at identifying what we don't want not so good at identifying what we do want it's very difficult to get to the goal if you cannot clearly define what the goal is and so i find that oftentimes we just get caught up in our excuses because we often can't see the answer and so instead of us feeling defined by not knowing the answer, how about we hit pause for a moment and we just get quiet for a moment and we just let the answers bubble up? I mean, when do we ever do that? Uh, I'm going to say hardly ever. Right? And um, what I think is really, uh, what I think would, Personally, what I have people do a lot of time is work through journaling, because Mm -hmm. if you if you write in the privacy, uh, it it, it's almost like a a a focus exercise. If you get into a place where it's nice and quiet, and you're able to write down what you're feeling, especially during the times that you're upset, especially during the times where you don't feel enough, write down exactly what you're feeling, and and typically you do that for enough times, and what happens is that you start to recognize that you have a pattern. Uh, You have the pattern of, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't feel, I don't feel like enough. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. 
we talk a lot about the imposter syndrome because mm -hmm. um, I've talked to people who were uh, PhDs and, and, you know, even with all the training, even with years of experience, these guys are going through the exact same thing as the high school dropout. So it's not an education thing. It's not an experience thing. It is just a matter of us talking to us, which is what I think is really awesome that you got to a point where you were realizing that, hey, this thing that I'm trying to attract, it's already here. I have to be willing to give it to myself. Uh, to that end, though, uh, when we start talking about value, when we start talking about the way that you value yourself, what about that? How, how, how do you help someone to feel valuable? Oh, you know, I'm a huge fan of I am statements. Okay. Now, I first heard about this through another mentor that I chose to follow, and um, she's a coach, and her name is Lisa Nichols. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. I don't know if you're familiar with Lisa and her uh -huh. story. She's got a fascinating story. And she talks about the value of I am statements. Uh -huh. And one day as I was sitting around feeling sorry for myself, I started to question like, gee, you know, I've heard some feedback. Not really a fan of what some of these people have said. You know, uh -huh. I'm just curious, like, what what do I do? What Where is my value? And I started to write out, I am. And I filled up two. I filled up the first nice. side of my paper. Nice. I flipped it over. I started doing it more. And I recognized, holy smokes, wow, look at all these things I am. You know what I need to do? I need to start telling me. I need to start saying this to myself every yeah. day. Yep. And so not only did I write out those statements because, well, Kelly, it's kind of taps into what you were talking about with journaling. Journaling, yep. yep. When we're writing out our feelings, yep. the actual pen to paper, first of all, yep. that's something we don't do very often. Yep. It's it, the, just the practice of journaling slows us down. Yep. But second of all, writing out those words, it's like your memory. It's going into your mind. It's like it's being mm -hmm. etched in there. Yep. And, and so every morning, as part of my morning routine, as part of my mindset reset, I would get in front of that mirror and read these statements out, these I am statements. Yep. And That's every single day I did that, I started to feel way, well, more and more confident and when those old, oh, limiting beliefs would pop up, I'm oh, sorry, I guess my power just went out for a second there. Nope, you're good. I, every, time those, every time that doubt would pop up mm -hmm. or a limiting belief would pop mm -hmm. up, I would start to counter that with I am. And I'll tell you, I just looked at that list the other day. I did that a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't need the list anymore because I memorized it and it's become part of my daily mantra. Nice. But that particular exercise is something that is really valuable. Yep. And guys, I think we may have lost Jen for a second. So we'll give her a minute to hop back on. Uh, actually, to continue on with what she was actually mentioning, uh, I think is actually a very, very great sort of point of view. One of the things that I've seen is that, oh, and I think we got her back. Yes, I don't. All right. Hey, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I, I was just uh, actually kind of following along that same train of thought. Uh, I did similar with the uh, I am statements. Uh, or I will statements. Uh, this is something that has been proven out uh, scientifically and it's part of the NLP. Uh, it is a case where the more you speak to it. So first off, we're always talking to ourselves. Uh, people think that it's just the crazy people that do it. But in essence, all of us are crazy because we're all doing it. I'm crazy. There you go. <laughs> One of the things that's happened though, is that I remember thinking to myself, um, my dad would have me listen to uh, yeah, you know, Tony Robbins and Les Brown and all these motivational speakers. And I remember, I remember literally thinking to myself, that's not for me. They're talking to somebody else. I can't do that. So the, the things that they are, uh, the things that they're talking about, 
there for someone else. And I remember uh, probably a couple of years ago, I did this for the last time. And I had like a list. I had a list of things that I was going to do, a list of things, you know, uh, they say make it um, uh, smart goals. And I put a time on each one. I said, I am, I do. And I am literally doing all of those things now. Like that is just a thing. I'm doing all of those things now. So it is just a matter of helping yourself uh, to your mind can only process one thought at a time. And the more time you spend in putting positive things in and talking to yourself about places where you either are doing well or places where you want to do better, uh, you know, as long as you're not doing it in the negative way, it definitely helps. It definitely helps. So I, I appreciate that you're building on a really good thought there. It really uh, is about training the mind. Yes. Yes. You know, it's interesting. I don't know about you, but throughout all my education, no one spoke about my mind. Right. 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 Uh, There's it, a it lot of research really, uh, on it. <laughs> right. It, 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 it's odd considering uh, how how often we're we behave or we react or we live based on these things that are uh you know false equations you know uh you believe that it, if 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 you were just uh, uh stood in the background enough or please other people enough that somehow it was going to be a case that you were going to acquire this love and then after enough times of doing it people still don't love you the same like people still devalue you and so it, it is just the thing to to really it, it's 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 forums like this where we can talk about these things and bring out uh, when when people see some, especially someone who's doing coaching and talking to other people. Uh, I saw I, I I work on coaching so many coaches because being a coach isn't the thing that stops you from going through those things. It's exploring them and it's talking to people. So in my mind, it's like yeah, I'm talking to people all the time about the places where I still feel fear and regret and flawed because those are the things that not only make me human and help me to relate to everyone else and help me to empathize with everybody else. Uh, it's also the place where I gain my strength from because, you know, which one of us is a, is a complete picture, which one of us is finished, you know? So from my point of view, I, I love the idea of working on me. I think that is awesome. Um, right. And many so people are good at motivating themselves and working on themselves and others well, we like to work with others. And so yep. coaching is a really good complement um, yep. during your personal development journey. Yep. Yep. Uh, and I'll be honest with you. I've learned so much more working with other people. Uh, the the stuff that I grew up listening to, my, my, dad's a, uh, my dad's a counselor, my mom's a nurse. It's like I grew up listening to them with stories of helping people. And and I guess it it, it, it sunk in. But I had no idea how to do it to help myself until I really started helping other people with it. Like it, it really does kind of put a mirror in front of your face and you can see the places where you find uh, places where you can grow and where you need to be better also. So uh, and, that, that um, is awesome. Also, Kelly, I just want to end with how fulfilling yes. it is to yes. to be able to empower another person yeah. To overcome something that you once struggled with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? It changes so much stuff for you personally. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. it feels, yeah, it's empowering, it's fulfilling. And for me, I found my purpose in that. Yes. And mm -hmm. meaning. And meaning. Yes. And now when I wake up in the morning, I, I've always been a happy person, but there's just even a bounce in my step now. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's so I need to lead it. with abundance now. That's right. Uh, speaking of, I want to make sure I, I've popped it up on the screen a couple of times. Tell everyone where they can reach you uh, in case they want to connect with you, in case they want to get some help from you. So go right on ahead. Sure. Well, there's three ways you can contact me or, well, one of them is you can follow me on LinkedIn under the hashtag Shatter Beliefs. Another way you can contact me, um, I think you used uh, the MJAL uh, email address, Kelly. I okay. actually have another email address that I prefer to use for work, and that is genuinelifecoach at gmail.com. 
Here, and spell it and out for us so everyone can Genuine can get is J E N U I N E. Mm -hmm. Life coach at gmail.com. And lastly, you could find me on my website. And you can find me under www.genuinelifecoach.com. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make sure we get these up on the screen. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. Yes, yes, yes. I want to make sure everyone can find a way to get to you. And those are also in the comments. That. So everyone will be able to find you. And also you can you can connect with Jen right on LinkedIn. And I already put in, I believe, your your LinkedIn info. Excellent. All right. So that's also yes. that's also in the comments. So anyone can click on that and they should be able to get in touch with you. Um for me, um, I believe I have my info in here too. It's because it is plug time. Oh no, that's yes. and that does not say shatter. That is <laughs> that, almost right. says shatter. <laughs> that that almost does. Um, right. with as for me, you can always reach me uh on LinkedIn. I'm Kelly Blackman. Uh, you'll see this video on LinkedIn, so <laughs> everyone should be able to, uh, to, right. to connect right from there. Um, also, you can go right to my website at bethinklive.com. So B-E-think-live, L-I-V-E.com. You can always schedule time with me, and uh, I'll be happy to help. Um, before we go, Jen, I want to just play my nifty little uh, outro, so then that way everyone can know that this is the end. All right, and you stay on, and we'll talk a little bit backstage. Okay, sounds great. Thank All you right, so thanks, much. Thanks, Jan. Right. Ta-da!